massive welcome to um, to all of you. And uh, here we are in Coffee Buddies again, again. And I think Graham and I counted them. We've done about 60, Graham, haven't we? 60. I know, I know. 60. I had my a full goodness. head of hair when I started. Uh, my goodness. And those of you who've been pretending have seen behind me, my room started with <laughs> no decoration. It got decorated. It's been covered. I think Tom was watching me as as uh, I was painting in between, uh, especially during lockdown. But in our 60 uh, adventures with different people, it's been wonderful. And Coffee Buddies is moving from strength to strength. We've got a lot of really good things coming and we pride ourselves in getting uh, interesting. And today is especially good because we have Kat, who uh, has been with us since uh, the uh, people talk about those dark days of lockdown, which wasn't very, very wasn't very long ago, was it? And my goodness, we, where are we going anyway? We don't know. But anyway, um, but Kat, it's a, it's a delight to, to have Kat come to talk to us. And uh, Kat's got a book that she's written and um, we're all fascinated to, to hear about it. And um, maybe Kat, you could introduce yourself to, <clears throat> to some of the people who don't know you. And maybe uh, just start telling us something about your book and then I'll I'll intervene. Thank yeah, you. welcome. Or Hello, hi everyone, and yeah, thanks very much for having me, guys. Um, yeah, I decided to release a book about a life-threatening condition in the middle of a life-threatening pandemic, uh, at a time when you can't do book talks, you can't do events. So, uh, just really appreciate the opportunity to come and sort of talk and explore and hear your questions about uh, if you're interested in the book writing process or the content of the book itself. The book is called Rebel Cell. Cancer, Evolution and the Science of Life. And it's really an exploration of where we are now in thinking about cancer as in, through more of an evolutionary lens from the origins of multicellular life all the way through to the challenges of how cancer evolves in the body and, uh, and how it sort of responds and evades treatments and then how we might use this more, you know, sort of ecological and uh, evolutionary idea to try and treat it more effectively. So look, just briefly about background about me. So I'm one of these people who trained as a scientist, uh, did you know my sort of PhD at the Gurdon Institute in Cambridge with Ross actually, hello Ross. And uh, then went to London to Imperial College to work with Amanda Fisher doing a brief postdoc and then went to Cancer Research UK for 12 years in the science comms team and did a whole range of jobs. I was working, working with the marketing teams. I was a media spokesperson. I was doing a lot of writing, uh, started the charity's podcast and the blog, all that kind of stuff. And that's really what started to get me interested in understanding and talking about cancer. And then uh, four years ago in 2016, brought my first book out, Herding Hemingway's Cats, which is all about how our genes work. Uh, big topic, never did get to the bottom of that. And uh, then Rebel Cell is my third book which is out now and in uh, the rest of the time when I'm not writing books, I'm running First Create the Media, which is a communications consultancy. We do content and strategy in the life sciences. So uh, where do you want to go from there, Tony? Well, so maybe, you know, three, I always start with three, three points from the book. What are the three take takeaways? If I, if I, because I'm a speed reader, Graham is a, is a line by line reader and I'm a, I'm a speed reader. And then if I get to the end, and I like it. I start again. But so, what if I was to read it? What's what are the three? What are the three things, Kat? So, one of the things that I really wanted to get across in the book. So, I sort of wanted to bust the myth that, or a common misconception, is that the idea that cancer is like just a modern disease, or cancer is just a human disease. And the more I looked at it, the more I realised like this is just a deep, fundamental biological process. And to those of us who are scientists, it might be like, well, yeah, but I think it's not, doesn't really hit home until you start to look at the extent to which we find cancer across the entire tree of life. And some of the ideas I was exploring about cancer really sort of as an emergent property out of tissues. So this idea that cancer is, is almost like a glitch in our biology, it's the price we pay for being multicellular organisms. If you're gonna be multicellular, if you're gonna be subject to the laws of evolution, which we are, uh, then you are going to get cancer. And there's things that we do that increase the risk, there's things we do that don't help ourselves, but fundamentally it's, it's a biological process that emerges out of tissue biology and multicellularity. So that's kind of one key idea. Um, the second key idea is really building on that idea that this is a, a tissue disease and we've become very, very granular. We've really become like genetically fixated 
on almost seeing cancers as a collection of cells or even as one cell with this like genetic laundry list of mutations that we can just pick off with targeted therapies. And that's what we're going to do. And that's because it's you know, relatively speaking, quite easy to look at the genetics of cancer. It's easy to do DNA sequencing compared to really thinking about tissue and tissue architecture and heterogeneity and understanding the ecology and the species of cells that are within our tissues and within a tumour. So that's sort of the, the other thing is that, you know, a, a railing against the genetic reductionist view of cancer, which really started, I guess, back in the 19th century and, and built into the somatic theory of, of cancer, that it's really, it's all about the mutations. And the more you look into it, it takes much more than mutation to make a cancer. And this is really how it show, showcased in the, the research that's coming out of places like the Sanger Institute, looking at normal tissue and discovering that by middle age, we are just a patchwork of mutation. Uh, so, you know, if, if all our cells are a bit sad and all our cells have kind of seen some stuff, what is the tipping point that turns sad cells into bad cells, into cancer cells? And that's not just about the mutations and about the cells. It's about the tissue environment in which they're in and in which they are evolving and subjected to pressures and to natural selection. So that's the second idea. And then the third idea is like, so what do we do about it? And so there's some, particularly towards the end of the book, is sort of exploring this idea again of like the, the you know, find the magic bullets approach to treating cancer, as opposed to perhaps stepping back and seeing it as an evolutionary problem. And this wonderfully burgeoning field of people taking a more evolutionary view of understanding cancer as a complex evolving system within the complex system of the body and then working out, okay, well, how do we actually understand the evolutionary trajectory of someone's cancer, the kind of the one-off choose your own adventure journey that everyone's cancer goes on. And how can we understand that? Can we find rules? Can we understand the kind of the, the, the paths and the, the options that cancers can take and then steer those to our advantage and looking at some of the really interesting work from people like um, Bob Gattenby at the Moffitt Cancer Institute down in Tampa in Florida, who's using sort of adaptive therapies and evolutionary strategies and all sorts of wonderful things like these things called Ersatzdrogers, which are kind of like fake drugs that occupy cancer cells and, and wear them out so that you could get them with something else. So, you know, I think there's some, where, some really where, fascinating strategies. So, three really good points. I mean, where, do, where does, um, is it disease? Is cancer a disease? Is cancer a disease? Hmm. I think, so there's, there's a few things to unpack there, because I've had people, you know, we're, I think we're all sophisticated enough to know that cancer is just not one thing. There is not one type of cancer. And if you want to get really granular about it, you can say, well, everyone's cancer is genetically unique. So there are as many types of cancer as there are cancers. Um, I think definitely the idea that cancer is much more of a tissue phenomenon than I think we've appreciated. And certainly the one thing that I've really come to see is that there are definitely quite big differences between different types of cancer. Like the hematological cancers are very, very different from solid tumors. And, and I think, you know, as many of us know, like childhood tumors are very, very different. And it, it's almost like, do we need different names for these? Or, or, but they're, you know, certainly um, what we would commonly think of as adult cancers, what, the more they are get, evolutionary. The more you go up in hierarchy of complexity, you, you end up leaving science and moving into philosophy and into psychology. And, and as you move into philosophy and psychology, you could argue that cancer is a disease. It, it, you just don't live so long. Now, and, and that butts very closely to the, the massive, which I don't get whether it's interesting or not, actually, but I've explored quite a lot of this aging world. You know, all of the money's going into aging mm. and analytic cells and apoptosis and all that. You know, my... my, my question to you I suppose is where does this philosophical thing go and where does it help a pragmatic drug hunter you know who's down there in the targets with the with the book of targets you know the famous mm -hmm. targets like the you know it's the book of princes from Monty Pythons and you know you're down there and you have to find a drug and you just have to stick it on there because that's the only place you can look so where, where does it all fit together Kat? So you, you've asked me about five different questions there. So I'm going to pick them off in the order that I want to. Um, so ooh, where do I start? So I think I'll start with the, the philosophy. 
And I think one of the interesting places that, particularly where I got to at the end of the book, I went to talk to Peter Campbell at the Sanger Institute. And I was like, you know, what is the end game here? You know, people have been trying to treat cancer better for over a hundred years. So we've made massive progress, but like, what's the end game? And he's like, well, you know, I guess it's that you live long enough to die of something else. And it's not the world's greatest marketing strategy. You know, I've worked for Cancer Research UK and, and our, our tagline was together we will beat cancer. It's not together we will enable you to live long enough so you can die of something else, yeah. uh, which is, is not terribly motivating. But, you know, ultimately this, it does sort of butt up to that philosophical thing. It's like, well, we do have to die of something. And I would rather, you know, die in my 90s if I have to die of cancer, I'd rather that it was then or in some kind of wild sexual misadventure, I think. Um, but, you know, we, we have to, we do all have to die of something. Um, but it's about, it's about premature death from cancer and also reduced quality of life for people having to live with cancer. So I think that, you know, there is a fundamentally philosophical thing about the whole enterprise of biomedical research, if you want to get really, I haven't got enough scotch to really talk about this now, but, uh, you know, what is, what is the point of all of this? It is to get us old enough to die of something else. Um, but there's a really interesting book coming out in December from a, a friend of mine called Andrew Steele, which is called Ageless. And that's looking at all this kind of stuff around aging and senescence. And it's almost like a, a mirror piece to rebel cell. It, it, is life a terminal illness? Yes, yes, Tom, it is. Um, and it, it's this sort of like, you know, aging and, and senescence and neurological diseases. They're diseases of too much death and, and cancer is sort of a disease of of too much life in the wrong place. Uh, again, we're, we're, in a, we're in a difficult place, but we're also in a place where your book is sending us, you know, is, is actually the, the treatment, is it, more of, is it more a psychological approach that you may only live to three score and 10? Is, is it, is actually, because your book is push, it pushes the boundary away from the pragmatic and the small to the big and the, and, and the, systems and, and that's where you you know you wonder what you should do what what should we do well, there's sort of, do that there's sort of two well many sides again with that so one of the ideas that i do explore quite a lot in the book is this idea it's called adaptive oncogenesis and it's been put forward by a guy called um, james de gregory who's in colorado and this is really trying to unpick the fact that as we age as we get older our cancer risk is not linear so it does not go up linearly with age. And this has always been a bit of a mystery. So it kind of, it's, it's very low pretty much through most of our years. And then from the sixties onwards, it starts to go up. And this has never really been explained because if cancer is purely about this kind of ticking up of mutations, you actually incur more mutations when you're younger because your cells are proliferating at a much higher rate. So, you know, this, this sort of doesn't work. So it's really exploring what are the adaptive mechanisms that we have evolved as a species over thousands and thousands of years to basically get to our 60s and 70s and then evolution kind of gives up on us which is you know for me like approaching my middle age is not what I terribly wanted to discover but so what we actually need to discover I think for, for cancer prevention I think here is an interesting opportunity for companies and researchers is to instead of focusing on what has gone wrong in cancer cells try and look at like what is right in healthy tissue and how do we maintain tissue health and tissue integrity and reduce inflammation and all the conditions that enable rogue cells to emerge. And the, the actually the other sort of big idea in the book is, is getting across this point that cancer is actually incredibly rare. And you, you say that sentence and that it's like, this seems deeply transgressive because you look around and, and one in two people in the UK will get cancer at some point in their lifetime. And you're like, it's incredibly common. It's incredibly common on a population level, but on a tissue level, it's incredibly rare. You're made of trillions and trillions of cells that divide billions and billions of times. And, and the work of people at the Sanger, you know, shows that we are just patchworks of mutations. And each time in our life, we may only have one emergent cancer, or maybe two if we're really unlucky. So like, what is it that is actually keeping tissue healthy through most of our lives and in our younger years. And oh, can we push that out further? I think is a really interesting area. Struggled with this concept that you can have systemic inflammation going on in you. You know, so this person has systemic inflammation. You can't find it, but it's a systemic inflammation. And that therefore they might maybe more susceptible to cancer. I, I think this is 
I mean, you know, I think this is, a, we're back to the big question about um, where does all of this fit in the cat? And if you take, yeah. if you take pragmatically uh, the drug world, for example, I mean, if you take the venture capitalists, and I, I know we have one at present, but a lot of the venture capitalists go after the, the single mutation area and they because they really like niche, they really want to go, they, they're doing the opposite, actually. They're going down the narrow band, not the upper band, you know? And how does that fit in, in your head? With, with what, do, what do you think about all that? Yeah, so the more I got to look at this, the more I kind of came up with some real problems with some of the ways that like, it's sort of again, the very reductionist models that we've gone down of targeted therapies. Because again, when you look at the evidence, these are not bringing transformative cures. I think we, we can park immunotherapy as a separate place. because I think that's sort of a separate, very interesting thing. But definitely the, the molecular targeted therapies, I have, a, uh, I have thoughts about um, just the whole ecosystem and the incentives for the way that those kind of drugs are developed and approved and marketed because they're not bringing, in most cases, real transformations in survival. Um, I think there's definitely a place for having as much in our arsenal as we can have, but you know, it, it sometimes does feel that all we've got is like a bag of spanners and some hammers instead of a really full, rich toolkit. And you know, talking to people like this and Al Lazikani at the ICR about trying to really understand where are the nodes, where are the different pathways? Can we just look in different places to find drugs that we can either combine together or, or use in more strategic ways? So I think the pharma industry has been guilty of just looking in the same places in a, in a and the sort of the me too problem that, that we know exists. So in the, in the, if you take the, like metaphorical magic, what, what's happening at the moment is the artificial intelligence brigade is being drawn in to be the, the, the problem solver over those issues you just raised up. In other words, that you've got this enormous map of multiple things going, more complexity than you've ever known in your life. And, they, and it's a bit like, don't worry, Tony, we've got a computer here, we'll sort it out. Yeah. I mean, what, did you get any, any thoughts about that sort of stuff? So I still, I, I think we do need to broaden our range of targets, for sure. Um, because like just the more options that you've got, not all cancers are the same, obviously. I still think like fundamentally and philosophically, you know, the idea that it's going to be one targeted therapy, or even if you need a cocktail, the, the problem of resistance is still always going to be there for advanced cancers because of the heterogeneity that you have in tumours. And the fact that this is an evolutionary system, and the, almost the more targeted your therapy is, the more selective pressure you're putting to kill the cells that are sensitive to it and leave the resistant ones there. And, you know, maybe you can sort of play this game of, of whack-a-mole, as I like to call it. You know, you, you give person, someone one drug and you wait till they become resistant to it. And then you give them another drug. And then you hope that, you know, in, in the year that they've got another drug will have come on the market and you can try another one, which is certainly why we need lots of drugs with different mechanisms and different targets. But it's, it's not, you know, it, it's still that sort of whack-a-mole approach and it will work for some time for, for many people. But I think where I got to in the end was like, can we even use what we've got in much more strategic and clever ways? Or even some of the older, dirtier drugs, you know, more cytostatic drugs that rather than trying to kill everything that's there, you're trying to almost like work out how can we balance cell populations in a, in a more clever way based on what we now know about, you know, the, the genetics of tumours, the heterogeneity of tumours and the potential evolutionary escape routes that they, they might potentially go down. And I suppose the, uh, the thing about cancer is that, you know, if you go around the world, there's so much attention on, on, on you know, every biotech, you know, so many of them are in it. It's a bit like um, we're, we're unweaving a story that it's going to be the same story for inflammation. It's going to be the same story for neurological diseases that we're going to be hit, hitting a but, abutting this massive complexity theory that we're going to have to then, my God, how do we do, invent a drug? Mm -hmm. um, Graham, I'm just thoughtful of time. I mean, this is a fantastic conversation and it could, I could take, we could go on for hours, but I mean, maybe we should, should Graham, should we take a couple of questions from the audience? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it would be really good. I mean, um, before I thank Sam, uh, let, let, yeah, let's, yeah. Uh, a couple of questions. Let's go for Samir first. 
Samir, my friend. Hi. Um, thank you so much. Sorry. Uh, apologies. I have to leave at uh, three. So this is why I pushed for this question. But really fascinating, um, fascinating discussion. And thank you so much, Kate, uh, Kate for sharing your insights. Um, I had a, you triggered a question in me and it comes from the experience of working with viruses and, and, uh, and you know, the, recently I watched this David Attenborough's uh, documentary with my kid. Uh, it was about this fungus called the zombie fungus, which lives in an ant and then outgrows. And the ant goes to the top of the tree uh, to acquire its senescence. It's almost like this fungus gets into the brain of the ant to guide it to the to the top of the cliff to uh, top of the tree to to commit suicide and then the ant is solidified and the fungus outgrows from the middle of the body and basically spreads its spores so my question to you in analogy with the, those two things does cancer have an ultimate or ulterior motive when it stems out of our, let's say, you know, we, are, we, we die, as per Tony suggested, that we don't live longer to see the consequence of cancer. Does cancer want to spread and kill itself or kill others or become like a virus? I don't know. What's, what's your take on that? Yeah, so this gets into the really interesting area of contagious cancers. And there's a whole chapter in the book where I talk about these. So you have things like the Tasmanian devil facial tumor. And um, the, there's a dog genital tumor that is contagious. And it's the actual cancer cells that are passed from animal to animal. So it's not a virus or anything like that. It's the actual cells. Uh, and there was like, there was a wonderful laboratory example. It was hamsters. Uh, it was like this cannibal zombie hamster cancer that was transmitting between the animals. And it's like, cancer doesn't have a goal in the same way that evolution doesn't have a goal, but it's, its aim is to survive. And if it has mechanisms by which it can survive and replicate and pass on its genes, i.e. by replicating, then it will. And it's kind of like the transmissible cancers are the ultimate leap of evolution. It's sort of, you know, you're leaving your doomed planet. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because ultimately for, for humans, each cancer does die within its host. And that means that every cancer is starting afresh and we can learn from that. But yeah, the transmissible cancers I found absolutely fascinating because they have made that final evolutionary leap to, to almost become their own, their own independent entity. It's, it's absolutely wild, the mm -hmm. transmissible cancer story. The, thank you. The two, the two viruses I've seen is the papilloma virus, for example, and the hepatitis B virus, which both are um, fascinating in connection with cancer causing viruses as well. Um, but thank you so much. Thank I mean, you. The, the, you know, Samir, I, I love it. I and mean, it just, this, just, you know, cause you're a virology guy. I mean, can you imagine a time that come, you could put a lockdown on cancer? Um, <laughs> and and you know, you know, the lockdown could be that when somebody gets to 12, they have a total blood transfusion or you fully irradiate their cells or something. And, and <laughs> because what you're saying is that that's a lockdown, isn't it? That's saying that you, you're, you're socially or society wise is going to totally address the problem. Yeah, Matt? I think it's not going to work like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, but understanding, understanding how, so that uh, I talk a lot in the book about this concept of the cellular society and, and the rebel cell concept, the name of the book, is this idea that cancer cells are kind of cheats emerging out of societies. And, and there's a woman I spoke to at Arizona, she studies cheating in all societies, whether it's human or animals or cellular. And it's, it's the same fundamental biological mechanism. Like it's cells or organisms kind of cheating over their neighbors, uh, depending on the, the tissue environment that they, they find themselves in. I, th I found that an absolutely fascinating concept to explore. Absolutely. Uh, Graham, I know, I know Ross has got a question for sure. <laughs> do you take yourself hi. off mute there you go Ross. okay hi cat that's hi, great Ross. thanks thanks very much for telling us about this this uh, i think you've just solved one of my christmas uh, present problems <laughs> excellent <laughs> uh, so um I, I was very interested in your comments about um sort of looking beyond uh you know can the you know our, our current almost philosophical view of what cancer is because it made me think immediately about the the, the modish new uh, senescence field where the idea there, uh, it's a, you know, the theory is that as we get older, we accumulate these zombie cells, these cells that are not only not functional, but they poison their neighbors. And therefore, if you kill them, 
you can um, you can stop people um, getting old and having sort of senescent type illnesses. And of course, you know they've made mice live longer, which is you know we could sit sit here and talk about that all day. But I was wondering wondering at what your your view is on the on the senescence field, especially given that Unity had a really big negative readout, where they're the first the, the really the first trial in humans, which probably burned quarter of a billion dollars to that point in, in venture capital money. Um, what's, um, what, what's your view on, uh, on the, the senescence sort of field? Because it, it fits in some ways to what you're saying. Yeah, I sort of, I, I don't know massively too much about it. Um, as I say, like sort of Andrew's book, Ageless, explores that a lot more. And it's almost, I focused on like what makes cells grow rather than what makes cells senesce. Um, I think generally more understanding of tissue biology and that how these cells kind of interplay and what aging really looks like in terms of things like clonal expansions and actually one of the really interesting um findings from the people at the Sanger is discovering like sort of what we would class as being oncogenic mutations in normal tissue that actually seem to be more prevalent in normal tissue than in cancers so it's like there's even some sort of oncogenic what we would think of as oncogenic mutations that seem to be protective and maybe they're sending cells down sort of a route uh, that means they can't become cancerous so I, that, I think there's just so much we don't really know about the journey of our cells because we don't do decent time series and also we don't study old people or old tissues we do all our experiments on like young mostly male mice and I yeah. the more I looked at this idea of sort of how our biology has adapted to our evolutionary trajectory over thousands and thousands of years it's like mice just terrible they live fast they die young they're incredibly cancer prone the tissues of a mouse are not fundamentally the same in terms of like the the aging clock than than human tissues so even if you are going to test cancer drugs, you should be testing them on like old mice, at least get yeah. some kind of, a, not six week old male mice, I think is the worst, worst cancer model you could use. Yeah, yeah I think that's a really good point. And, and, and to, to sort of take, to, to back that up, you think about the, the human, um, you know, sequencing of people who are 100 years old studies to look for the Methuselah gene. And it, all these guys have is just that they have good alleles at the 40 or 50 alleles that we know shorten your life. They, they haven't got any of the bad genes. So, you know, it's yeah. eat, eat, eat healthy and don't smoke, right? I mean, pretty much. Um, I think I would add, um, I think that obesity and exercise are going to prove important for the tissue biology. Because what we really don't understand is why is obesity a risk factor for cancer? And I think that is going to, because that is a systemic factor. And I think it is going to have the systemic impact. And then also we don't really understand why physical activity is good for you, but it absolutely demonstrably is. Yeah. And so again, I think that that's a systemic tissue effect, um, which I think is very interesting. And it's this balance of the mutations, like don't add to your mutational load for sure. And then also do what you can to keep your tissues healthy. But also the other thing is fundamentally, like there is an underlying non-zero risk of cancer emerging in your tissues because that's just what it does and has done for thousands and thousands and thousands of years it's a bummer really right well that's uh <laughs> tom's got a question so um, yeah uh, you know uh, absolutely fascinating talk Kat, and um, so many questions uh, i started with one but my second one i i think is if we think that gene mutations and point mutations that play a part some part you know and uh, do you think stem cells a therapy related to what you've been describing with regard to the cellular environment you know james black said many years ago that stem cells you know are a danger you know because of the oncogenetic you know effects but as we become more sophisticated, do you think, you know, there's a future with regard to um, an army of directed stem cells to treat these specific diseases? I, I think it very much depends what do you mean by stem cells? Because that was something else that I sort of ended up touching on a, a bit in the book is like what is a stem cell and we're talking to people like Hans Clavers in the Netherlands it's like stemness is a is a state not a fate and we've sort of got this idea that 
you know, stem cells are stem cells are stem cells. But when you look at some tissues, like you look at the liver, like there is no hepatocyte stem cell. Mm. And hepat that's why the liver is so incredibly regenerative. You can cut half of it off and it will grow back. And when you look in tissues like the bowel, like cells that have embarked on a differentiation process will return and become stem cells again. So I don't know when you start, when you say stem cell, I'm like, mm -hmm, yeah. like yeah. what? Yeah. So, <laughs> mm. so yeah, I think that the concept of stemness, because there's, there's so much interest in like, yeah. are stem cells the progenitor cells for cancer? Like what is the, the cancer stem cell? And I, I think that's just a, a really tangly question and probably depends again on the tissue. Mm. But this is why I said an army, you know, an army is full of various sorts of disciplines and uh, units, you know, and, you know, defining, you're quite right, defining, you know, what is a stem cell. But it takes me back to, you know, what you were saying with this milieu of, of, of tissues and cells, you know, and how, you know, from a, perhaps an early age, we can identify, you know, these, as, you know, Ross was saying, you know, which, you know, project you know to a greater longevity yeah i think that the really big challenge that that i really see in cancer is basically like all, all our cells are sad like they've all got genetic mutations of various sorts and many of which that if we found them in a cancer we would say that was an oncogenic mutation so there's sort of things about like well what do we understand about how our clones are expanding mm. as we age and like spotting the ones that are on that have got the potential to go rogue and what does that process really look like and I think um so again thinking from Tony's perspective about what's really interesting here from a pharmaceutical perspective what I think is really interesting is that what looks like the tipping point into frank cancer is chromosomal instability. It's not just about the mutations, it's about the chromosomal chaos that is in cancer cells. So you've got genome duplications, you've got doubling, you've got aneuploidy. I think these things are really, really, really interesting. What is it that uh, enables aneuploidy chromosomal instability to happen? How can we find and remove those cells? Uh, I think is a really interesting challenge because cancer is not just about the point mutations because loads of your cells are full of oncogenic point mutations. Most of your cells will never become a cancer cell. And the ones that do, do seem to have chromosomal instability. So what triggers that? How can we detect that? What impact does that have? Uh, because that stuff is like rocket fuel for evolution. And so I, th I think that those are really interesting areas for, for research. Fantastic. Yes, I think and we've I'm got a quick question from Catherine. Have you got a quick question, Catherine? Yeah, I have. I hate to bring it down to this level, though. <laughs> it's so fascinating what we've been talking about. Yeah, so I'm more tempted not to ask it now. <laughs> uh, so, Kat, it's great that you and I are catching up on some of the other things um, in a couple of in next week. I think we've, we've got a meeting. Um, so I'm just kind of interested in terms of your your business model. I don't know how much you want to sh share with that, but thinking about the whole process of writing books and whether you even make any money from doing it, because uh. <laughs> I've just gone through that my the first one and uh, you know just about to publish and launch. There's no way that I'm going to sort of make any money directly from it. That's for sure. So interested in your thoughts. So the, the very first piece of advice I was told when a good friend of mine who has already written books, when I said I was going to write a book, he was like, do not write the book for money. I was like, okay. Um, and I can seriously back that up and especially launching a book in a pandemic when literally no one is reading about cancer, talking about cancer, reviewing books on cancer or buying books on cancer. Um, but he said, do not write the book for money, write the book for what it will do for you. And that's the advice that I give all the authors that I talk to and people who want to write a book. It's like, how does having this book or how will having written this book that you think you want to write, what person like does that support? What journey does that support and enable you to do? Because for my first book, I knew that I wanted to go freelance from Cancer Research UK. I'd been there a long time. I wanted to become a freelance. So I needed to be like the author of this book. And I used it to springboard writing, getting contacts with editors, being known as sort of, it, it bought me expertise basically. Um, and then this book was just basically the book that I really, really wanted to write because it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and it was the, the book I really, really wanted to write uh, at the time. Now it's weird, it took so long to write this one. It's, I've been working on it for three years 
And in the meantime, I set up my business and the business has really sort of taken over in terms of what I do. So yeah, first create the media now is the, where my, my work and my income comes from. But yeah, certainly uh, do not write a book for money, but write a book because it really supports the, the place that you want to be in having written the book, if that makes sense. Just, just want to double check with Rebecca whether you want to add to your comments or uh, you're quite uh, happy for us to round up. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, hi, sorry about that. No, it's just when you said about rebel cells and the thought that went through my mind, some of the companies that I look at are more diagnostics. Um, and they're sort of looking at, you know, the part of the challenge with cancer is early detection or that mm. sort of stuff. And we have quite a lot of dis discussion. And the thought that went through my mind was, is um, what is the concept of the manageable rogue cell? So cancer is cropping up all the time, as you say, but, you know, for a lot of, I mean, I think it's a particular issue in some types of cancers, isn't it? Where actually is, should you treat it or not? And how much should you treat it? And actually the body's really good at getting rid of the rogue cells when yeah. they crop up. And if we've got an immune system and you know, it's a bit like um, uh, you go to two dentists and one of them thinks you need a filling and the other doesn't, you know, it's not scientific. It's a, <laughs> it's a kind of a judgment. So, you know, it just, it was just, I just, I part way through your book. I don't know if you get to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I do explore <laughs> that. Observation. Yeah. Diagnosis is, going to be is such a big part of it but when yeah. to treat is like the, the the challenge that we sort of don't always talk about exactly over diagnosis um the sort of the uh, whether you're actually whether you are actually prolonging life or just diagnosing something earlier uh, and separating sad from bad we in, at CRUK we used to talk a lot about like tell, telling tigers from pussycats and the more we understand that like that normal tissue is a mutational landscape as well like really what does define malignant tissue or malignant cells and how can we genuinely identify them and not over treat um that's actually one of the big cancer research uk grand challenges is looking at that problem in dcis in in very very early stage sort of stage zero breast cancer because i think there's a, a significant over treatment that goes on there and also in prostate cancer as well so i think that that is that is a really big uh, big hot topic okay i think we're doing I think a little round up and then a little split up, aren't we? So let's thank Kat in a big way. And it's a break for our YouTube.